This morning, 48 hours left in the legislative session. Who won and who lost? Two questions we will ask before the gavel falls. Arlington looking to become the biggest tourist destination between Las Vegas and Orlando. Mayor Jeff Williams with us to explain how his city could soon look a lot different. Texas now set to ban critical race theory, changing how and what teachers discuss in the classroom. Dallas's superintendent hints to us, though, that his district could go to court over it. And police reform largely failed this legislative session, all except for one bill. Bo's Law passed with bipartisan support. And State Rep. Carl Sherman is with us on changes now coming to Texas law enforcement. Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. Good Sunday morning to our viewers across the state. I'm Jason Whiteley. Let's begin this week getting you caught up in all the top political headlines here in Texas. State lawmakers will adjourn their regular legislative session tomorrow, but things have been tense at the Capitol here in the final few days. The Republican Senate and the Republican House both mad at one another for not passing bills that each chamber had declared priorities. Then listen to this, the Senate told House Speaker Dade Phelan he could not enter that chamber because Phelan was not wearing a wristband showing he took a COVID test. Medical marijuana is expanding in Texas again. Patients with all forms of PTSD and cancer will now be eligible for it, but not anyone suffering from chronic pain. Plus the amount of THC allowed will also increase. And Texas lawmakers have approved a $248 billion budget over the next two years. That's the only bill they are constitutionally required to pass. It's less than the last two years budget because the state got to use federal stimulus money, but Governor Abbott can still go through it line by line and veto things he doesn't like. Let's begin this morning though on the local level and a bold plan by a Texas city to position itself as the largest entertainment destination between Las Vegas and Orlando. Arlington is already known as the home of the Dallas Cowboys and the Texas Rangers, but a second hotel is now coming to the stadium developments, and so are hundreds of apartments as well. Setting the groundwork for all of it is one of the final projects for Arlington's outgoing mayor, Jeff Williams, who joined us from his office there at City Hall. Mayor Williams, it's good to see you again. I, I want to start with the $81 million that Arlington is getting from the federal government's coronavirus uh, relief that goes to, directly to cities. $81 million. How is Arlington going to spend that money? Well, we're going to be restoring our plan that we had back in January of 2020 uh, before everything hit. Uh, and so that does include uh, we had 100 vacant positions that we'll now be able to fill. Uh, we had a lot of programs and budget cuts. In fact, every one of our departments uh, had a 3 to 8 percent budget cut. And so we'll start uh, back in with those programs and so forth, and especially in our public safety areas uh, there in police and fire and being able to move that ahead. Uh, we are uh, we experienced a reduction, of course, in tourism, which is a big part of, of what we have also in our retail areas. And so we'll be working with those businesses there also to try to uh, get us back to where we were before the before the pandemic. Obviously, Arlington debuted the brand new Major League Baseball stadium this season. It was supposed to open last season, of course. Uh, NFL is next door with the Dallas Cowboys. There's the Texas Live development, that, that huge development in between, which is fantastic as well. I'm curious what kind of economic development you think remains for the city as you depart the mayor's office? Well, we're pretty excited, Jason, because what you just talked about, uh, their signified development actually occurring between those stadiums because we now have Texas Live, the largest entertainment complex. We have a luxury hotel. Stay tuned. We're going to be building a 900-room hotel and convention center uh, that will be there. And then we also are going to be having people live uh, out in our entertainment district. So we won't be calling it entertainment district. We'll be calling it the district uh, there because we'll have people living there. And we also, uh, something that uh, happened during the pandemic is that Six Flags moved their world headquarters into the old ballpark. And then that old ballpark has been hugely valuable. And uh, in fact, we've been having Texas high school football in it. We've had professional soccer and stay tuned for rugby. 
uh, that's going to be played. Mayor, I may have missed some of this news, but I didn't realize that uh, I know there was talk early on about about raising the old stadium. Uh, that doesn't look like that's going to happen, huh? No, Jason, I tell you, uh, I cannot tell you the number of people who uh, have said that on social media so much so. And I'm, I'm glad to get that straight out because we never intended to uh, to demolish the old ballpark. It has great value. And in fact, uh, it's one of the coolest places to have an office building anywhere and uh, and the architectural quality and so forth. And stay tuned because uh, we'll be uh, doing more. I expect us to expand the offices there. I expect to see more sports occurring uh, in it. And then even the concourses are all designed to be able to house retail and restaurants. So uh, that is going to be a valuable facility for decades to come. Mayor, under your watch over the last six years, the city has moved forward with some massive large-scale development. How do you think your successor, though, should move the city forward outside of the, the district there? Well, I think we have tremendous momentum. And so continuing to be aggressive, to bring jobs in uh, there, to continue to grow tourism. Our goal is for this Metroplex to be the destination between Orlando and Vegas. Uh, I think we have a great opportunity to do that. Arlington is certainly the leader of tourism here. But when you combine all that we have to offer here in North Texas, there is no reason that can't happen. And then, Jason, that means OPM other people's money coming into the Metroplex. And we love that uh, when we bring tourism here, but also uh, all of the tourist attractions help the quality of life for all of our citizens. Mayor, congratulations on all your accomplishments. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate the coverage that you give here and uh, it's so badly needed uh, to get the word out. And we're looking forward to the future here in Arlington. Mayor, thank you. Now to Austin, less than 48 hours left in the legislative session. Before we dig into what won this session and what did not, let's talk about all the chatter of a potential special session. Ross Ramsey keeps his ear to the ground at the Capitol as the co-founder and executive editor of the Texas Tribune. Ross, good morning to you. Good morning, Jason. How are you? Doing well here. You know, we know that lawmakers are coming back later this year to redraw congressional lines since Texas gets two new congressional seats. But how likely is a second special session like Governor Patrick wants? You know, I won't have a final answer for that until the legislature gavels out and we see what's left undone. I think the chances of a June session are receding, but I think the lieutenant governor has made a pretty good case to the governor about putting other things on the agenda for an October session. We'll see how it goes, but uh, right now, I'm optimistic we won't have a summer summer session. I, I know everyone down there is probably ready to uh, to go home, return to the districts. Let's talk about uh, George P. Bush and uh, Ken Paxton. George P., of course, uh, challenging Ken Paxton for attorney general. This whole thing really could ride on whether Donald Trump weighs into the race. Do you expect that he will? I do expect that he will. I mean, he's in a position where he can he can tilt this one way or the other. Ken Paxton, the attorney general, was one of the people who spoke to the president's rally on January 6th before some of the people at that rally went on to invade the Capitol. Uh, Bush has stuck with Trump. So against, you know, really against his family. So Trump has yeah. reasons to go either way. And I think it would be very influential in a Republican primary. Yeah, no, no doubt about that. Ross, back to you in a moment. Thank you. Coming up, police reform largely failed this session, but one bill passed. State Rep. Carl Sherman, a Democrat from DeSoto, on his bill that's now heading to the governor's desk. And Texas is set to ban critical race theory, changing how and what teachers discuss in the classroom. Dallas' superintendent hints to us, though, that his district might sue over it. You're watching Inside Texas Politics. Back in February, state leaders made all kinds of promises to us, saying they would fix the energy failures that plunged millions of us into the freezing dark. Some bills are poised to pass, but experts say read the fine print. Those bills are not going to do what you think. This was an eye-opening episode of our political podcast called Yolitics. If your phone is handy, turn on the camera, aim it there at the QR code on screen. It will take you directly to this episode. Remember, new episodes come out every Tuesday morning. After all those protests we saw last year, Texas lawmakers have decided not to change in the way police operate in the state. There is one bill that passed, though, a bill named for Botham Jean, a black
black man shot to death in his own apartment in Dallas by a white police officer who said she thought she was entering her entering her own place. State Rep Carl Sherman from DeSoto introduced Bo's law with bipartisan support and this bill now heading to the governor's desk to become law. Representative Sherman, congratulations on the passage of uh, Bo's law here. What's the significance of this bill passing with bipartisan votes? Well, it's extremely significant uh, as it relates to police reform. Uh, this bill has always been about establishing systemic accountability in policing. And I believe this bill does that. And explain for our viewers exactly what this bill will do. Well, uh, quite simply, the bill requires that law enforcement must activate their body cam uh, before or during an investigation, and more importantly, that they cannot turn off their body cam during the middle of an investigation. This is very critical, uh, as we've seen even with the case of a, a young man, Mr. Green, uh, that's in Louisiana or, or that was there where the state troopers uh, they turned off the audio portion of their body cams. Uh, it's so important that it's not only about ensuring that uh, the uh, evidence is not edited or redacted, but it also uh, creates evidence. Because if you don't have body cams on, and if you don't leave them on for the duration of the investigation, then you quite possibly uh, don't have evidence that is critical uh, to any case. One of the things that I've found uh, in talking with uh, criminal uh, attorneys, defense attorneys, is that uh, they applaud the step in this, in Bo's law, because it creates uh, that uh, consistent uh, uh, requirement that police officers cannot turn off their body cams during an investigation while there are several agencies that have this as a requirement, not all, and policies do not trump law. And so it was important to make this consistent throughout the 254 counties in the state of Texas. Representative Sherman, congratulations, and we appreciate the time. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate you. Now to education this morning. Have you heard the term critical race theory? Texas lawmakers are banning it essentially telling teachers they cannot take sides when discussing current events that are controversial, no matter the topic, George Floyd, the January 6th riot at the Capitol, etc. Dr. Michael Hinojosa says this caught many educators in Texas by surprise. Hinojosa is a superintendent at Dallas ISD. Dr. Hinojosa, it's good to see you again. I wanted to talk about what's happening in Austin. Critical race theory has now passed the Texas House. It's passed the Texas Senate. And it says that teachers cannot be required to discuss current events, things like the George Floyd murder in Minneapolis. But if they do talk about this, they have to include all perspectives. How do you expect this to play out in Dallas classrooms? Well, it's, it's going to be a very difficult thing to implement, and we are, we're actually very confused about it. It was something that we weren't really even monitoring. We had, didn't know that much about that this was even being debated. Now, the district has a racial equity policy and uh, a lot of training that we've done, and so now we have to evaluate. I have to hire lawyers to find out how much of this we can teach. And then, you know, nowadays, you know, the students sometimes record their teachers. So we may have people that have the race equity police that may be turning things in. So there's going to be a lot of interpretation on this. This is happening in several states. And so we're studying how we're going to implement this. And I need to have a serious conversation with the school board um, once this, if this bill becomes a law, which it looks like it's going to in the next few days. So we need to, need to discuss what our next steps are. We'll, we'll talk about those next steps. Is this something that you think that Dallas ought to consider um, legal action over? Well, you know, that's always an option, and I would hate to do that, you know, behind a microphone or a camera, but it's an option that we have to consider. Uh, and I report to a school board. I don't have the authority to sue anybody, but the board is very serious. They passed this policy 9-0 about making sure we appreciate people's multiple perspectives and cultures and climate. And they're required, all of us, to get training on this, from the board themselves to my team to every employee, and they wanted us to get it all in one year. So we may have to pivot and either stop that or pursue it and then take on a challenge. Who knows? Stay tuned. It's going to be interesting. 
What else are you watching from the legislature as it winds down here? Well, I want to be uh, appreciative that we did protect House Bill 3, which was our number one priority. Jason, last session, we were the darlings of the session. This session, we haven't been very darling. I think we've been taking a, a few licks on it, but it, that's the way, you know, that's politics. You got to be ready to deal with it. Um, but in the end, we have some good things and then we have some troubling things. And that, that happens a lot in this process. Dallas ISD has found a lot of success in something called P-TECH. It's Pathways and Technology Early College High School. And essentially students can uh, go to school, Dallas ISD schools, obviously tuition free, but also earn college credit on this. You're looking at expanding this, huh? Yeah, we've been very excited about this. I, let me just tell you a couple of quick stats. In 2009, when I was superintendent here in Inahosa 1.0, only 7% of our kids got any kind of post-secondary credential six years after they graduated from high school. Hmm. This year, despite the pandemic, we're going to have over 10% of our kids get an associate's degree when they're still in high school before the six-year clock starts. And they're paired with AT&T, Southwest Airlines, American Airlines, Accenture. We have all of these industry partners that these kids are now qualifying for jobs and internships. So this has been wildly successful. And in following it, we have our career institutes where we, you don't have to get an associate's degree. You may need a few college hours, but you get trained in cybersecurity and aviation. So all of these things are now coming together. And in my career, I'm really proud of what our team has pulled off in making this happen. These kids are going to be a lot better off and they're going to be able to buy property in Southern Dallas because they're going to have a disposable income because of this training and skills that they're getting. Yeah, it's really a game changer. These kids don't have to worry about how they're going to pay for college later on, What you know, wherever they go, right? They won't have a, they won't have any debt. They'll have making a good salary. They'll have a stackable credentials in, in cybersecurity. So that if they want to go to college and still pay for that, they can do that. Or for the other kids in P-TECH, they're already finished two years of college. And we've learned once you get two years, now you believe you can get a bachelor. So this is really, 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 we're really proud of our entire community who helped us pull this off. Dr. Hinojosu, uh, congratulations on, on this uh, trying school year and good luck in the fall. Thank you. It's always great to be with you and your viewers. Thank you. 48 hours left in the legislative session. What won? What lost? Two questions that we will ask before the gavel falls next on the round. Table. This is Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley. Time now for Reporters Roundtable to put the headlines in perspective. Ross Ramsey is back with us from the Texas Tribune. Bud Kennedy is here from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. And Bernadine Steptoe is a political producer at WFAA in Dallas and joins us for this segment as well. Let's start out with the biggest news, which is obviously the end of the legislative session, Ross. And the easy question right now, who and what won, who and what lost this session, in your opinion? I, you know, I think the Republicans had a really good session. They had a pretty good election. The Democrats didn't make any inroads. It showed in the agenda and in the results from this session. And I think they can walk away with some victories. They're going to be some whining about the things they didn't get. But they got a lot further with a lot of issues that had stalled over the years, like constitutional carry, the fetal heartbeat build, and some other things. Um, I think they're going to have to count this a win. Yeah, they certainly have things to run on next year, don't they, bud? Uh, conservative Republicans won a lot and passed a lot of bills. Just in general of what won, you know, uh, you have to say that the drinkers won. I think the fact that you can get margaritas to go now, uh, you can get beer and wine at 10 a.m. in a convenience store instead of noon on Sunday. You know, uh, liquor was, and restaurants were one of the first people to get their bills passed in the legislature. What, what lost in your opinion? Well, you know, I think you have to look at electric rate payers. The, you know, who's going to be on the hook for winterizing all those gas plants? We are. The, the state didn't pay any of the money to winterize the plants. Uh, all those costs are passed along to all of us who pay our electric bills. Bernadine, same question for you. What won? What lost? I think uh, what won was the conservative activist because they're the ones who stayed on the Republican lawmakers to ensure that this conservative agenda was passed. Now, again, I want to say, too, that we as taxpayers lost uh, uh, pertaining to the electric grids because nothing has, uh, has changed in terms of ensuring that, that uh, we get the power, but that we don't carry the price for the power. But I think that, and then keep in mind, Democrats couldn't lose or win because they didn't have any power, yeah. but they did hold off some of uh, 
Lieutenant Governor Patrick's priorities. Well, let, let's talk about that, uh, Ross, and you, you just kind of mentioned that a few moments ago. Uh, House Republicans really kind of, uh, uh, you know, turned down some of the priorities that Lieutenant Governor wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, was this really that conservative of a session? Dan Patrick says no. Who's right here? Well, I think it was a very conservative session. I do also think that Dan Patrick and some other Republicans are worried more about the challengers they might get in a Republican primary, and those would come from the most conservative end of the pool. So that's the noises that they're making right now. The House was a little bit less conservative, a little less willing to do some of the things the Senate was going to do. It's essentially the same House that Joe Strauss had, and there are a lot of members in there, Republican members, who know they would vote a particular way in public, but privately are telling the Speaker, hey, it'd be great if that didn't come up for a vote. Hmm. Bud? Well, you know, uh, Lieutenant Governor Patrick had a closer election last time. He won by 51%. Governor Abbott had it pretty easy. Uh, but but Patrick was more of a drag on the ticket along with Ken Paxton and Ted Cruz. So he wants to really submit his vote. He wanted to pass all a couple of dozen of his priorities. He got almost all of them passed. Bernadine, this is all about next year's election, it sounds like. It's always about next year's election. Uh, the sessions are always about next year's elections, which is, is heavily on Abbott's mind as well. So we'll see what happens with these special sessions or whatever, but keep in mind, this is politics. And politics is always about an election it, it, and it the all, upcoming election. Yeah, it always is about the next election. Exactly yes. right about that. Guys, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you for watching as well. We're back again next Sunday to take you inside Texas politics. Hope you enjoy the rest of this Memorial Day weekend. Take care.